Thanks for joining us today. The topic for today's webinar is a new approach to stem cell research and kinetic whole wall imaging. Before we move into the content of today's webinar, I'd like to introduce our concept of live content imaging, which is our focus here at Essen. So how do we define live content imaging? It is the acquisition, analysis, and quantification of images from living cells that remain unperturbed by detection methods, allowing for repeated measurements over long periods of time. And this can go from several days to several weeks. Our view of live content imaging has four key aspects those being live cell imaging, high content, light microscopy, and plate reader simplicity. Over here in the purple, live cell imaging is the spatiotemporal real-time resolution of cellular phenotypic changes. Here you can record a history, make movies and images for publications and training aids. We add the dimension of time. Uh, you can move forward and backward in time to see how your biology began, how it changed, when it changed, and how things ended up make new discoveries by observing things that are missed with standard endpoint assays, and prevent biological perturbations by maintaining cells within the incubator. High content in yellow, um, three-channel multiplex assays enable users to ask high-level questions and develop complex biological models. Uh, users can also transform kinetic data into informed plate-based pharmacology. Over in green, light microscopy, um, Incusite hosts HD phase contrast and two color fluorescence. We now have the ability to image in the whole well, which I'll go into detail in today's talk. And with this type of microscopy, you can monitor your cells from the desktop. Finally, plate reader simplicity and label enables users of all experience to perform high level work using simple and intuitive software. Multiple user access also removes laboratory bottlenecks and promotes a sense of collaboration. The instrument we use to make live content imaging a reality is the Incusite Zoom. Zoom is a fo fully automatic and two-color fluorescent plus phase press microscope that fits inside a standard tissue culture incubator. Because the cells being imaged in Zoom are within the tissue culture incubator, the design is ideal for kinetic long-term live content imaging. To add to the live content imaging approach, we've now added whole well imaging as the new imaging option. So when you open the user interface for Incusite's upcoming software update, you're going to notice a few additions if you are a current Incusite user. Up here, the viewport highlights where you are within the well you're looking at. So at this point, you'll notice that the entire uh, well is encompassed by a pink box. Um, and, and this is because as you see below in the viewport, you're zoomed all the way out and uh, you're your focus is the whole wall itself. Um, as you see in a minute in a movie we're going to show, um, when you zoom into the well and focus on different areas, that viewport's going to change. It'll become smaller as you zoom in, and it will keep up with you as you um, pan through the well. We now have several helpful options for scanning through the whole well with navigation control tools. You can use arrow tools or the plus and minus keys to move your way through the well. However, my personal favorite is select the home icon, which takes you to the upper left corner of the well, and then selecting the play button, which then begins to automatically move you through the well. You move right, down, and left, which is a similar fashion that someone might do on a stereoscope or a standard microscope. Again, you'll see this um, in more detail in an upcoming movie. Um, finally, here on the right, in the blue box, are two new great features. Um, we have the ability to mark objects as points of interest, and we also have a printing mark tool, um, which I will go into more detail on these two features later in the talk. We retain our three micron resolution, and this is one well of a six well plate, which has a 35 millimeter diameter. So the whole well image from, from this well um, is created from 124 sub images at 4x magnification. So as I mentioned, here's a movie we're going to show, um, which talks you through some of the, which will move you through some of the new software features. Uh, again, before I start, I want to remind everybody to increase your resolution on this movie and subsequent movies in the presentation um, to get the highest viewing quality. So as we zoom into the well, please notice the changes in the viewport area. We, 
we pause and then uh, select our panning tool to move us through the remainder of the well from our location of interest. It moves uh, right, uh, right to left, down, left to right. And as you can see, you're going to scrutinize the vessel all the way up to the edge. And you can do so with great clarity. I'm just going to let this movie run through one more time uh, just to make sure that there were no delays on the viewer's end. So we felt like um, a whole well strategy is best used in a rare event scenario. And one way in which we exemplified the use of whole well imaging is by stepping into the stem cell field and looking at iPSC reprogramming. So the big idea behind reprogramming of somatic cell types into stem cells is that you can take a patient's own cells or a donor cell line where it's appropriate and um, you revert them back to an undifferentiated state of pluripotency so that cells can then be differentiated into any cell type of the body. Those cells can be used in a variety of ways, including cell therapy and subsequent transplantation, disease modeling like Parkinson's disease, drug screening and discovery, as well as toxicity evaluation. The results of these types of studies allow for the discovery of a molecular or cellular basis for the disease itself, and perhaps even new drugs to treat the diseases or disorders. Successful reprogramming and generation of a sufficient or a very large amount of material is key to all these different methods of research. And with current protocols being utilized, IPSC reprogramming efficiencies are at around 1% or less. <clears throat> um, so this makes this process a rare event. Getting good starting material can be a technical and time-consuming challenge. So in order for successful reprogramming to occur, there are several events that have to fall into place. We use the classic Yamanaka factors delivered by a Sendai virus in our reprogramming studies. OSKM, which is an abbreviation for the Yamanaka factors of OCT4, SOX2, KLF4, and CMYK, must get into the starting cell type, which in our case were neonatal foreskin fibroblasts and um, human adult dermal fibroblasts. And then this began to unravel key transcriptional changes. This then begins the early phase of reprogramming, where cells rapidly proliferate and appear more round and smaller in size. During the middle phase of reprogramming, those small round cells form tightly packed clusters, which then become the colony shape typical of an embryonic stem cell colony. Fully reprogrammed true iPSCs and human embryonic stem cell colonies are indistinguishable from other in culture. Um, and as you've just seen, Zoom has success successfully captured those morphological changes I just described, which are classic to the stages of reprogramming. So as I mentioned earlier, IPSC reprogramming can be a technical and time-consuming challenge. Along with low reprogramming efficiencies, um, the generation of IPSCs from somatic cells takes several weeks. And then the expansion and subsequent characterization of stem cells could take upwards of months. And these cells are continuously changing in culture. Colonies that arise early in the process, these are the ones that I see and think I've got some winners. Um, those can change very quickly and become ugly with differentiation later in the process. Therefore, following colonies that have desirable qualities can be challenging. As any iPSC researcher, uh, any pluripotent stem cell researcher knows so well, um, cultures need to be inspected and felled daily. I can say that I personally sing Christmas carols to my cultures this past December. These cultures are very sensitive and researchers get very nervous about time outside of the hood. Changes in temperature, pH, and risks of contamination are always on the mind of the researcher. And if I could add one more thing here, in every stem cell lab I've spent time in, the stereoscopes and open-faced biosafety hoods, um, those have been shared among lab users or among a whole list of core facility users. The more work you can do on Zoom, as in the more time spent examining your vessels from the desktop, is more time freed up on the equipment, which is nice for all the users of those shared spaces. So to help 
stem some of those challenges and to help improve the IPSD reprogramming workflow, we've devised an approach to the stem cell culture that includes aspects of the live content imaging methodology. Integrating Zoom gives users the opportunity for time-lapse monitoring of cultures from the desktop, the ability to pan through the whole well of cultures with HD imaging right out to the edge of the well or dish, um, and high-quality image or movie generation for record-keeping or collaboration purposes. The stem cell player application was developed in collaboration with Life Technologies. We used their Sendai viral based reprogramming reagent, Cytoin, um, an efficient and non-integrating method containing the classic Yamanaka factors, to reprogram neonatal foreskin fibroblasts and adult dermal fibroblasts, both human. We imaged the reprogramming event in Incusite Zoom in a cell culture incubator at 4X and whole well, and we collected images every four hours through the several weeks of reprogramming. Throughout that reprogramming timeline, I observed my cultures daily from my desk as opposed to outside the incubator on a stereoscope. In this way, the reprogramming cells, which are very sensitive cultures, um, spend as much time as possible in the incubator. With the live content Im imaging approach, we gather kinetic information about cultures so that we can move forward or backward in time to inspect wells, find colonies and see what they look like from their start to the last scan before positive selection. Utilizing the software tools, we labeled and tracked emerging colonies. When the time came to positively select clones, we used the marking tool to draw circles or squares around the colonies of interest on the vessel so that we could then remove the plate from Zoom, move right into the stereoscope, and quickly microdissect and transfer clones into fresh cast plates. In this way, we utilized whole well imaging to monitor, inspect, and maintain stem cell colonies from the comfort of my desk while my cells remained happy inside the cell culture incubator as opposed to spending that time in the biosafety cabinet on a stereoscope and then out of the temperature and conditions that the cells prefer. This slide presents an overview of the repro reprogramming workflow um, that I use to exemplify rare event imaging. As mentioned previously, I used Life Technology Cytotune Reagent to reprogram two different cell lines, and this was a, roughly a month or about a four week long experiment. The cells were seeded two days ahead of Cytotune addition, and it did take that amount of time for the cells to reach 80 to 90 percent confluence, which was a point at which the reagent could be added to the cells. I used the confluence metric in Zoom to help monitor this process. So after Cytotune addition, the media, uh, 24 hours later, the media was exchanged. Um, I fed the cells every other day until around day, uh, until day seven, at which time I lifted the transitioning cells and then reseeded them onto freshly prepared um, fibroblast, um, mouse embryonic fibroblast feeder plates or gel tracks, which was a um, matrix material I used to exemplify feeder-free culture system. I fed the cells daily, and I also inspected the vessels daily to watch for emerging, potentially pluripotent colonies. Somewhere around day 14, 15, I noticed that the colonies began to emerge um, and exhibit a more typical stem cell colony morphology. Between days 19 and 27, colonies believed to be pluripotent were positively selected for. I think it's important to note that everywhere you see an upside down red triangle is a time point where I was inspecting my wells on a stereoscope. However, integrating zoom into the workflow kept those cultures inside the incubator and I was imaging from my desk um, so that those vessels only really needed to be removed for very quick media exchanges and then of course the positive selection at the end of the experiment. Visualizing the reprogramming experiment in its entirety allows the user to get much more information from the process. During those early reprogramming events, we monitored the growth kinetics of our budding fibroblast population. In order to standardize the reprogramming protocol, we utilized the confluence metric to assess if the cells were all at consistent levels of confluence prior to addition of cytotune. And you can, of course, do this with any reprogramming reagent you use. Um, 
We closely observed cell morphology after reagent addition. It's widely recognized that there's some amount of cytotoxicity resulting from the use of reprogramming reagents, and you're able to evaluate that in Zoom. A user can also monitor transduction efficiencies using the proper tools to do so. And of course, just a general thought, you can monitor cell health um, and any possible contamination throughout this process. So as I just said, some amount of cytotoxicity is expected after using a reprogramming reagent. If you're interested in analyzing the toxicity of your reprogramming reagent, you can do so by observing morphological changes of the cells or by utilizing a cell impermeable DNA dye if you have the wells to sacrifice in your experiment. By observation of phase images, as you see here on the left of the screen, you can make qualitative observations about toxicity. Here I have um, some of my neonatal foreskin fibroblasts. This, um, on the left-hand side, this was before the addition of the cytotune Sendai virus. And on the right side, you'll see those same cells in the exact location uh, 48 hours after the addition of cytotune. So the toxicity of the reagent has caused some obvious morphological changes in cell distress. For a more qualitative approach, life technologies and using the cell player cytotoxicity assay added a reagent to quantify the amount of toxicity associated with different reprogramming reagents. The y-axis represents fluorescent object count or cytotoxic object count over time. Um, you'll notice that the cytotune Sendai virus 1.0 is more, slightly more toxic than the Sendai virus 2.0, which is a new reagent that they have. Um, and then that can be very telling for future experimental planning. This is another experiment provided to us by Life Technologies. This is a reagent used for reprogramming. This is the Sendai virus um, with GFP loaded, so it's a control reagent. GFP is expressed if successful transduction has occurred. Therefore, when the cells are transduced by this particular control vector, they're going to fluoresce green. So the idea being that you can use zoom and kinetic images in order to monitor transduction, timing, and efficiency. I have a movie I'll show that illustrates this point nicely. And as a reminder, um, for best resolution for viewing quality, please turn it up. So again, these are neonatal foreskin fibroblasts infected by a GFP Sendai. Um, Successful transduction allows the green fluorescence protein expression. I'll allow the video to play a second time just in case anybody's having viewing issues. So moving on to now the middle to late reprogramming event, um, you can watch the evolution of these emerging colonies. I think this is a very exciting time in the reprogramming timeline. Every day I sat with, at my desk with my coffee in hand and I used the automatic panning tool to move through all my wells um, that I had imaged during reprogramming. As interesting colonies emerged, I labeled them as points of interest and I tracked those specific colonies within the software. If you have fluorescent monitors, you can image in both phase and red or green fluorescence, and you can monitor your reporters through the process. Using the fluorescent filters, you can apply a reagent used to label pluripotent colonies to aid in the calculating of reprogramming efficiencies or to watch for pluripotency. And last but not least, when the time comes to positively select those potentially pluripotent colonies, you can place printing marks digitally in the software around those colonies to be selected and then you uh, remove your objective, place the IncuSight marking tool in its place, which is a new product we have, um, and the marks will be applied to the physical vessel in the exact way that you um, set it up in the software. So in this way, you simply remove your plate or dish from Zoom, and then you move right into the hood, find your circles or squares, uh, printing marks, and quickly perform the manual work, transferring out your pieces of colony into freshly prepared cast plates. If you decide you're not done and you want to positively select for a second or third time, you can simply wipe off the printing marks from the vessel with 70% ethanol and a Kim wipe. You put your plate or dish right back into Zoom and continue imaging until you're ready for positive selection again. So 
So as I said, during those middle events of reprogramming, this is that exciting time where you get, begin to watch those pluripotent colonies emerge. It gives you a lot of hope. With the whole well being imaged, you get HD quality images right up to the edge of the well or dish. As I mentioned previously, um, on day seven, the cells that are transitioning are lifted and reseeded onto either feeder cells or the feeder free matrix material of your choice. And then the transitioning cells settle down and begin to evolve into colonies. Traditionally, when observing um, the vessels on the stereoscope, you might be able to identify colonies around day 14 or 15. However, using the incusite imaging, I spent quite a bit more time and really thoroughly inspected the whole well. And because of that, colonies were identified earlier. And using the time tree, I could then move back in time to see what that colony looked like at the time of reseeding. And then move forward from there to watch that colony develop over time. So again, instead of removing the vessels from the incubator and very quickly inspecting them daily on the stereoscope, you can spend your time and monitor them and zoom from your desk. Aside from tracking colony emergence and progress, you can export those images, as I've done here, and you can see on day 7, day 12, and day 17 of this particular colony. Um, you can also make a movie of colony development to share with others or to make a record of reprogramming. So these are neonatal foreskin fibroblasts reprogrammed using Cytotune. This movie uh, takes us from seven, just after the cells are seeded onto mouse embryonic fibroblast feeder cells, all the way through to day 19, just before the colony was positively selected. The colony that, um, you, uh, that you really want to watch is up here in the upper left corner, and you'll see um, that grow and become more embryonic stem cell colony-like, and then you'll actually see it get picked. And again, if you're having um, any kind of viewing issues, please remember to turn up the resolution for best viewing quality on your computer. You see that colony become uh, quite large, look very much like an embryonic stem cell, and it gets fixed. <laughs> we'll go through the movie one more time in case anybody uh, wants to spend a little bit more time. It is important to note that this was uh, my very first successful pluripotent colony, and uh, it did um, confirm for pluripotency several passages later uh, through immunocytochemistry. All right. I'm going to move us right into um, our, the next movie. This was provided to us from Life Technologies as part of our collaboration. These are neonatal foreskin fibroblasts, again, reprogrammed using Cytotune. Um, however, these were transitioned onto gel tracks in Essential 6 media supplemented with basic FGS. The movie begins at day 7, just after transitioning onto gel tracks, um, and goes until just before positive selection. So you'll notice all the debris accumulating surrounding that emerging colony in the center. This is a feeder-free system, so of course those are not any kind of feeder cells. Um, those are all cells that are fibroblasts that either partially reprogrammed or failed to reprogram, as well as just dead and uh, dead cells and debris. So I gave you an overview of the new whole well software features uh, a short time ago but making these features more specific as a stem cell colony tracking tool, there are two very helpful new additions to the user interface. And again, I'm referring back to the blue box material on the inter user interface. These are point of interest and printing marks. Emerging colonies can be marked as points of interest and followed throughout the experiment. A running list of POIs can be found in the Manage POI section. And when the time comes for positive selection of your colonies, you can digitally add printing marks around the colonies you wish to manually remove from your well or dish. And then the Incusite marking tool will print the physical marks on the vessel. So more on these printing marks in just a few slides.
after you label your colonies as points of interest and as you kinetically monitor those POIs, um, you have some additional handy tools available to, to you. As you've now seen, the navigation panning tool will help you quickly and comfortably move through your Weller dish. You have the ability to create unique names for your POIs and to create a log of POIs in each vessel or dish. The go to feature we have uh, now allows you to select each POI individually and find it immediately within the well or dish. So in this way, if you don't care to observe the whole well, like I did at a certain point, and prefer to go straight to your areas of interest, it's very easy to just select and go. Using the diameter tool we provide, you can measure your colony size. You can keep a virtual notebook by making experimental notes regarding your points of interest. Also, you can track the date of colony emergence or point of interest emergence and selection. And this is a graphable feature. And um, you can bin your POIs into different groups of your interests. All this and a cup of coffee while at your desk checking out your POIs. So reprogramming efficiency is routinely calculated using a terminal alkaline phosphatase reagent. In our case, we used one from Vector. Pluripotent colonies are highly AP positive and are labeled red after reagent addition. This particular reagent we used is both color metric and fluorescent. And on the left is an image from a red fluorescent scan of this experiment in Zoom. So these are reprogrammed colonies. They were formerly neonatal uh, foreskin fibroblasts that were terminally labeled with the vector red AP reagent. So um, the red fluorescent colonies are counted as pluripotent. This experiment was performed on the day of selection. Typically colonies stained red are counted by eye and a microscope by a researcher. And this can be very subjective as two researchers who count the same well might walk away with two very different numbers. Depending on what each of the re, uh, researchers might call positive and might call a colony. Using Incusite, you can mask and count red fluorescent colonies and using filters like area and minimum and maximum red fluorescent values, you define what constitutes an AP positive colony, making what was a subjective observation a more objective science. So to finish the story, once you've got your alkaline phosphatase positive colony count, you divide by the number of cells seeded into that well on day seven. Multiplying that by 100% gives you your percent reprogramming efficiency. I, I do want to note that this is not a live reagent. So in this experiment, um, this terminal reagent, uh, tumor, terminal experiment, the well was sacrificed in order to calculate reprogramming efficiency. So this was a spare well that had undergone the exact same condition. Also, fixation of colonies prior to labeling helped kept the, uh, keep the colonies whole during um, the labeling procedure. So looking down the road to post reprogramming events, utilizing Zoom, you can continue to monitor your colony transfer post selection and the survival of those pieces of colony. It's widely suggested that if you pick a colony that is not pluripotent at the time of selection, that it's going to completely differentiate within the first several passages. With that, you can continue to image, track pluripotency and differentiation. Whole well images were scanned daily to check for evidence of differentiation in pluripotent uh, cultures. And then I also used it to monitor colony growth so that I could prepare myself for passage. Um, and then once again, utilizing the fluorescent features of Zoom, IPSC colonies were eventually, after 12 to 15 passages, characterized for pluripotency using immunocytochemistry. So potentially pluripotent colonies have been positively selected for. So what's next? If a colony isn't truly pluripotent, as I said, it has been discussed that colonies completely differentiate within those first couple of passages. So using Incusite, uh, we imaged and followed almost all of our clones that were selected in order to see what happened to them during those early passages. So in this case, um, I'm going to show a movie of an IPSC clone originally derived from um, neonatal foreskin fibroblasts that I carried in a feeder-free system. So again, this was Geltrex and Essential 8 Media. You can watch as these small pieces of colony grow and expand. This is a final reminder, please turn up the resolution for the best viewing quality of this movie on your computer. 
I'll play this movie twice, but um, in, lo in looking at the film, as, as colonies in a feeder-free environment grow, they're far less prone to differentiation. Therefore, colonies can grow together. If you allow colonies in a feeder-free system to do so within five or so days, you're going to end up with like one large colony um, in most, taking up most of your vessel. So this is a very different scenario than that of your feeder system, where allowing colonies to grow together or, or even in close proximity to one another is discouraged due to the differentiation that tends to pop up. Love that movie. Okay. So here I have a IPSC colony post passage. So this is a pluripotent stem cell line that is experiencing some general differentiation in the culture. So you can clearly see three cell types here in this image. We have our mouse embryonic fibroblast feeder cells in the background here. And then we have the stem cell colony with its kind of a central compact core. And then around that is a third cell type um, of differentiating cells. These cells are larger, flat, and they've lost that high nuclear to low cytoplasm ratio that's typical of a stem cell colony. So I personally use images like this, as well as movies that I've derived from Incusite, to train my colleagues on the characteristics of a good and bad colony, as well as how to spot, find, and manage differentiation. So just kind of talking this through, what does the researcher do at this point? Well, as you know, we're either going to want to clean the differentiation or remove the colony altogether. So if there's only a few colonies with evident differentiation in your dish, the researcher can choose to try and clean away the differentiated cells or, as I said, physically remove the whole colony in order to cleanly dispose of undesirable cells. You don't want it to influence the rest of your good culture. So going back to the software, I'm going to that printing mark, you can digitally place a circle or a square around your colony of interest and any others like it in the dish. Um, and when you're ready, you can remove your objective put in the Incusite marking tool in its place, um, hit print, and those digital marks you strategically placed in the software will be printed onto the actual well or dish. You can replace your objective and then take your plate out and perform the manual work. Now here we have an example of a pluripotency confirmation experiment through immunocytochemistry. This is a double label experiment with a green um, Alexa Fluor 488 labeled SSEA4 and OCT4, which has been labeled with a red fluorescent secondary antibody, Alexa Fluor 594. SSEA4 is a cell surface marker expressed on pluripotent and some multipotent stem cells. OCT4 is, of course, one of the Yamanaka factors, as we've discussed, um, and it's an intracellular marker highly expressed in pluripotent stem cells. So the loss of OCT4 expression results in differentiation of stem cells and starts to send them on their way down their fate path. So we've provided the whole well overview of this experiment, as well as what might be my favorite image of all my experiments, two, uh, two fine looking double positive pluripotent colonies. So to summarize everything we've discussed today, uh, we've added the dimension of time using HD imaging. You can move forward and backward in time to monitor colony evolution and in morphological changes. HD phase imaging takes you right out to the edge of your vessel with sharp image quality. You can streamline your workflow and protect your culture. You spend more time at your desk while your cells spend more time in the incubator. And in doing so, you're also removing laboratory bottlenecks you might have. Standardized protocol. You can monitor cells prior to and post reprogramming factor addition optimize transduction efficiencies, and objectively quantify reprogramming efficiencies. In terms of monitoring rare events, we see whole well imaging as a basic function for rare event monitoring. You can pinpoint and follow rare events using digital marking tools, easily pan through wells with navigation controls, and we provide automated processing and movie making tools. Our integrated image processors make analyzing data on the fly simple and it's very easy to make and share images in movies. Um, and this facilitates collaboration and um, provides a teaching tool. So with that, I thank you for your time and I'd love to answer any questions you have. 
Okay, so one question that's come for, through. Uh, can you monitor reporters during reprogramming? Um, yes, and we encourage you to give that a try. You can scan accordingly. So you would scan in phase and the fluorescent, either red or green. Um, and you can detect when your reporters turn on and off. So uh, that, should, that should be definitely something um, you, could, you could give a try. Next question. Uh, can whole wall imaging be done in any other objective besides 4X? At this time, whole wall imaging is a 4X uh, application. When will the software be available? It's right around the corner. The software update will be coming to you um, early November. Are there any other applications of whole wall imaging besides stem cells? Yes, uh, we, we do have a dilution cloning application and um, that'll be out shortly as well. And that is a whole well imaging application um, as well. So question, when you analyze um, generation of new colonies with your cup of coffee, how much time did you spend identifying and tracking colonies in the morning? So it's a very good question. I did this experiment in two parts. The, the first round of reprogramming, I was very new and very cautious and would sometimes spend, you know, I would say seven to ten minutes, which, um, you know, per, per well or dish, really just spending the time training myself and what I'm looking for. As I got a little bit more experience, that, of course, um, you know, the, t the timing for each well and vessel dropped down. However, I had many, many wells going in the experiment. If I want to export a movie of a specific colony, can I export any field of view, i.e. zoomed in? You absolutely can. You can zoom in around a specific colony and create an image set or movies um, that, incorporate, um, that incorporate just that colony. So you can definitely zoom in. Um, is your system capable of doing a hypoxic culture? Yes, IncuSite um, can go into hypoxic incubators and you can perform your experiments under those conditions. Of course, feel free to email us at sales at smbio.com if you have any further questions or would like to schedule a demo. Um, we can certainly have one of the salespeople in your area give you a call and set that up for you as well so that you can actually um, see and test this uh, technology on your own. I'd like to remind you that uh, we do have uh, webinars on pretty much a monthly basis unless there are any major holidays or things like that. We will have another webinar um, coming up later this month, so please stay tuned to our website for that information. And be sure to connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Highly encourage you to do that as we often have um, a lot of announcements, especially for new releases and um, special events um, on our social media as well. So Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, be sure to uh, connect with us there. You can find those links on our website as well. And uh, we thank you very much for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Yeah.